ever hold the rods. And the reason why is if you hold the rods, you're gonna limit your fishing time to about two hours. Now, if my wife is in the room, what is my average fishing session? Six to eight hours. So even if they're light rods, sometimes I will do it just to try to get a feel of what the fish are doing. But once you put it in the pole holder and I set that line taunt, so I throw it out there and I get that line taunt. So it's down to the line and it's either swiveling around it or it's in the uh, egg sinker and it's just rolling. The rest of it is all about reading it. The pole holder is really important because if you use just a plastic tube, I've lost two pole rigs with plastic tubes. Plastic tubes are deaf. You need something that spikes in and goes down. A 25 pound bat ray will pull any one of these rigs straight up out of the tube and launch it like a mortar shot. So you need to have the drag loose and you need to have that thing dug down in. I had a dolphin one day in Mission Bay and lost like a $300 setup. It literally sounded like a rocket launcher coming out of the tube. And then you'd watch it go in the water. Very discouraging when that happens. So let's say I'm fishing, I'm fishing this. I'm fishing this rod in the pole holder. One of, one of the greatest videos on YouTube, is it a bite or is it weed? Is it a bite or is it weed? It's just somebody took the time to do something that I'm just going to explain it to you. You have to understand, once I'm fishing, all I'm watching is the last three islets of bug poles. I have one pole here, then the other pole is about 15 yards apart. They're both in pole holders. They're always angled. I never fish a pole upright. They're always angled. They're in the sand and they're angled, okay? I'm sitting in my green chair and I'm watching. If you break the tip off of your pole and you lose like this last tip and you're like, oh no, no big deal, I'll just cut it right there, throw the pole away. You've changed everything about the parabolic bed. You've changed everything about how that pole was designed to respond. If it says seven two and you're buying someone's used pole and you measure it at seven foot, just hand them the pole back and say thanks, but no. It needs to have the tip. All the action, all the light is right there. The whole, whatever, medium parabolic bend, it's all right there. Now, once I watch that, I'm watching both of them. And I'm watching both. My wife's talking, people are talking. I'm still watching because I'm waiting for one little teeny tip. Sometimes that's all it is. And that's the halibut. He's got it and he's trying, to, he's trying to figure out what's going on. Then I run to my pole. Then I run, right? And I'm done. And then everything's loose. So drag's always loose. The first thing I do is I tighten up. I get all the way back on the line. And then I'm holding it just like this. I'm just waiting to feel it. Now when I feel that halibut put it back in his mouth, and I tuna whack him. I, I don't, I don't. I'm going to release him anyways, but I want it in their mouth. I don't want it in their gullet. So if I know it's in their mouth, and I go hard and back, hard and back, wherever people are, I give it them. I put it in them. And sometimes you barely get like a piece of lip and you still get them. That's why fishing secret number 101. Before you, you got to change out your hooks. You want to know if a hook's sharp? That's a sharp hook, <laughs> right? Owner, number one, number two, mosquito, fly wires. Spectacular hooks. Before you put a hook on, Take your fingernail. Oh yeah. Your your my fingernail is completely shaped weird because of it, and pull it back one time. See how it does that little shaving? Mm -hmm. That's a sharp hook. If your hook does not shave your fingernail, it's not going to pierce a fierce uh, fish's jaw. I want it right here. This is where I want it, because if I can get the hook in his lip, the other thing is what they call the gap. That gap is crucial to the size fish you're fishing for. As long as this gap is right, he can get it around it. If I get that, that keeps the line out of his mouth, right? Once they gullet it, then especially for a halibut, the mouth is chewing on the line. Not only is there a good chance I'm going to lose the fish, but then he's going to have a hook buried in his mouth, and I don't want that. So check your hooks. Check them frequently. If you fish with it last session and you come back out and you're just going to throw it back out there, take the extra five minutes, clip it off, put a fresh hook on there, check your line in between fish catches, it looks funky, yeah, but I don't know how else to do it because that's the only way I fit. If there's a nick or a burr or abrasion or any kind of little thing and you think it's no big deal, that's the time when you're going to hook a 10-pound sand bass or an 8-pound calico from the shore and it's going to snap right off on you and you're never even going to have a chance to figure out what it is. Finally, one last thing. Any of you guys wear waders? Waders? Any wader fishermen? No? Not, doesn't happen yet? I made the mistake. Uh, this is Columbia gear. I like, I like PFG a lot. I made the mistake of being out in the rain one day in my what I thought was a waterproof jacket. There's a big difference between water resistance and water repellent. Let's just start with that phrase. 
when you get wet, your fishing is over. But if you happen to be wearing waders along with that, so I went to the Columbia store. This is um, on the way to Palm Springs. You know those outlet centers? The Columbia store is there. You can buy PFG gear there for 70% off retail. Don't buy used gear from anyone. Just go there. And they had $500, $600 rain gear that was like for professional great fishermen who live on a boat, lobstermen, that kind of gear. Huck stuff, you know that stuff that's all rubber, one millimeter, two millimeter, two gauge stuff. Full PFG, $250. The sticker on it said 900 This is a water, this is Omni. So Omni Shield, is, this is, you can pour water on me. You can turn the hose on me. Not only do I not get wet, but now when I wear this over my waders, because I do, I'm in the water a lot. Yeah, that was pretty good. When I go in the water, I cover my waders on the outside. And then I cinch this puppy down, and then it's got little ties right here and I pull those things tight. This gives me an extra two to three minutes if I fall in the water from water going down in. I can't tell you how many times I see guys with their jacket inside their waders and their waders exposed. Remember, we're fishing rips, we're fishing currents. If you have to go out there to land something and you fall in that with waders, the ocean doesn't care. It's gnarly. It's a very scary thing to be in waders and, and underwater. But if you do happen to have a better jacket that is water repellent, and totally water resistant and it's over the top of your gear. If you do fall, you can fix your reel. I dunked whole reels. I lost one setup for 20 minutes while I was catching a fish. Came back out there, took off all my clothes, walked out in the water, hit the rod, picked it up, pulled it back in and fished with it for another hour before it finally froze up. You can, you can fix a rod, but you can't fix you. If you're gonna go out there in waders, be cautious about having them tight at the top. And another thing too is I always wear rubber boots. I don't go fishing any time ever. There are so many stingrays here locally. I must catch 10, 15 stingrays on every adventure I go on. They're everywhere. Now when I catch them, I break the stingers off because I don't even want anyone to step on them. But I don't know if you guys do that or not, but there's a lot of stingrays out there and a little teeny one can harpoon you just as much as a big one. I saw a guy land a stingray yesterday, put his hand around it like it was a fish. And you could see the stinger trying to get to him. I mean, he was within like one inch. If you get hit by a stingray one time, you won't make that error again on how to unhook a stingray. <laughs> I turn them upside down like a pancake, white side up, and I step down on the tail because the stinger comes out this way. So once they're down, upside down, and this way, they can't sting anything. Now their mouth is open like a cart, and I grab the pliers with the line tight, and I pop them off there, and with my shoes still down, I flip them back out because they're trying to orientate themselves. Never had any issues ever. Don't even fool around. That's what killed Steve Irwin with the giant stingray. They're gnarly. Now, bat rays don't have stingers. They just have big, long tails like threshers, like thresher sharks. And if you do happen to catch a bat ray, be very careful about trying to pose with it or do anything like that. So guys stand them up like triangles and they take pictures so that the tail's down. But they will full-blown whip you, especially once you get them in shore and they get mad. And if you lean down to get the hook, be cautious. They'll absolutely go right at your face with their tail, which it's a pretty, like I said, let it happen once, it won't happen again. That's pretty much all I have. Is there any other questions about? On the barometric pressure, do you, do you recommend fishing when it goes lower than the green or higher than the green? So that's what's cool. Either way triggers fish. I haven't found it to be high is better or low is better, but just that move from the everyday green, that's key. And sometimes it can just be barely off of the green into the blue. It doesn't have to be a large change, but to a fish it is. Now if it stays two or three days with the pressure, it might die off. But in that four, five, six hours, 12 hour window, when it first moves, if you can match the tide and get to the fish, it's gonna make a big difference. It's gonna make a big difference. What's the three apps again? The three apps are surf line, so you can figure out the waves before you go down there because anything over four foot, a little iffy. Five foot, it's gonna, it's gonna blow you out. So one to three is an absolute no, two to four, be prepared, surf line. Tides near me. Tides near me is gonna tell you incoming, outgoing, and then you can hit middle, there's a middle uh, bar on that and that's graph. It'll show you the week and then actually give you a 2.6 in, 1.7 out. And what you're looking for is the greatest variance of water movement. The more water that moves in and the more water that moves out, especially if you want to try something fun like all the way down at Bolsa, if you try one of the inlets, fish an incoming tide in an inlet, you never have any idea from sharks to rays to halibuts to corbina. They love incoming tides. It brings all that outside water in 
and there's a lot of cold water and movement in that. There's a lot of bait, smelt, anchovies moving in that. It's great. You always want to try to fish the incoming tide because the fish are kind of prepping themselves at the incoming, they're going to ambush here. When the tide's going out like this, the fish usually will back off into their zones or they'll go all the way to where the tide's receding and fish. It's really hard to fish just, if you throw out and it's just going out the whole time, you got to move. That's death from an inlet. That's, there's no way, you're not going to catch anything there. Yes? What time you go fishing? So I work Monday through Thursday from 8.30 to about 3.30. And I get to the water usually about 4, 4.30 because caught a couple of surfers too recently. <laughs> and this is what I've discovered. Catch them on the light rod, they break the line, they feel strong and like they got the upper hand. Hang them on the 10 foot or the 11 foot rod and hang them, ooh, it's interesting. So I try to stay away from surfers or swimmers or people that don't understand it's a fishing pole thus fishing line, hooks. So I, I try to go when there's no people. There's a lot of beach here, so you can find empty space no matter what. The lifeguards will tell you you have to have 500 yards between you and a swimmer or surfer or a bodyboarder. 500 yards? 500 yards. But and, I, move, right? and I always tell them, I'll give you 500 feet. That's about as much as you get. Sometimes I fish channels and there's just too many people and I just call my wife and I quit. It's just, you gotta wait. And I wait till 5.30 or 6, it gets dark. Everyone gets out, and that's when I set up my gear, and people are like, what are you doing? Like, nothing, just, and I wait till everyone leaves, and the beach is just me. So you fished at midnight? I do, I, and you know what? It's not whether it's legal or whatever, but here's another thing that I discovered. When you're fishing at night, I got these little things from uh, eBay, and you break them, and they shine for two days. And this little thing clips onto the pole. That's why all these poles have these clips. And what this gives me the chance to do is I can fish at night with no light, so I don't have to turn the light on and check anything. And this doesn't ring. If I, you fish with me with a bell, just to let you know, there's no <laughs> bell fishing with me. Leave your bells for the Sierras when you're catching plant or trout. You know, line is what they communicate phone lines on, right? So when you have line going in the water and you have a Christmas tree bell up there, you're just sending music down the line. To get away from me, go fish somewhere else. This is just the light. And this little light, uh, depending on how the sensitivity of the pole works, some might fish it down a little more, some I might slide it up more, or whatever it is. But they all, all the ones that are regular fish will have it on there. And then that little light shines. I can order them in green, red, blue, whatever. Sometimes I fish with other guys, and so we'll call out my colors. Hey, green's got a hit, red's got a hit. But it's kind of cool, you know? We get 20 poles out at nighttime, all these lights on them. And it's a, it's a sight. It's like a fireworks show out there sometimes. I just start hitting and bouncing all over. And it won't come off. Well, you can't fling it off when you're casting. Um, Uncle Bob's. Uncle Bob's is the holder. They call it, it's called the torchlight. If you buy it here in the States, if you go on eBay, you can buy them direct from China for like four cents a piece. I just buy them in bulk like two, three hundred at a time for like four cents a piece. It takes like two weeks for them to get here, but if you're going to fish at night, and then the box is just swivels, hooks, weights, and then a lot of halibut rakes because if you, like I said, if you've never caught a halibut, you, gotta, you can spend the three bucks until you learn how to tie your own. Most of mine are all self-tied now, but when, I, when, when, when the fishing's hot and heavy, and they're, you know, okay, I need a one, I need a two, I need a four, I don't have time to tie them, I just go grab these out of my bag. This is absolute liquid gold for any surf fisherman. If you want to catch a halibut and you've never caught one before, this is going to change your odds. You find low tide, you find a sandbar, you find an inlet, you find some rough water next to a sandbar, Put an anchovy on there, nose hook it. If you want, keep it. Um, you can tie what's called a, a sna uh, trap hook, right? So what you do is, when you nose hook it with the top one, you get a little three inch piece of line, you put a treble on, you nose hook the top of the chovy, then you take that little three inch line with a treble and then you tail hook it. Because 50% of your halibut bites are what they call shorts. <clears throat> they'll come up as that anchovy's fluttering in the water and they'll come up and they'll sample at it. And when you bring your bait in and it's stripped, and it's just like a head and ribs, or you bring it in and half is perfectly gone, that's a Hallie talking to you saying, Where do you get, get those? What, the trap hooks? Those little oh, this is just West Marine. I buy these in bulk from West Marine. They're like two bucks, three bucks. West Marine, okay. Yeah. Remember it's just as good in the bay? Uh, in the bay? Oh, I fish halibut everywhere. I caught them in the bay, in the inlet. You can't name a beach that I haven't caught a halibut from. If there's water, and especially the low tides are really tough to fish, but low tides are corbina. Spotfin croaker, you guys are caught a spotfin, oh my gosh. Tory Pines has, I caught a spotfin croaker in Oceanside last year, it's nine pounds. 
So if you want a nine pound fish on six, eight pound rig, it's like, it's like yellowtail fishing from the shore. And people freak out. I mean, another fun thing about surf fishing, when you start dragging fish out of the ocean, the first leopard shark you catch or smooth hound or whatever, and it's like the shark and its mouth is actually going and the kids start screaming. It's a glorious, surf fish is glorious. I mean, they're all like, 